Welcome to HealthWise here on WTVI. I'm your host, Joey Pop. Earlier this season, we examined what's new in hip and knee replacement. Well, during this episode of the medical broadcast, we'll continue that discussion with part two. Joining us to talk about hip and knee replacement options are doctors from Ortho Carolina. We welcome Dr. Brian Springer and Dr. Neil Sheth. We'll also open up the telephone lines to take your questions, or you can email me. You can go to our Facebook page now to submit your questions at WTVI.org. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for being here. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. Yes, and Dr. Springer, this is your second appearance on HealthWise. You've been on before. Correct. It's good to be back. Yeah, well, it's great to have you. And Dr. Neil Sheth, this is your first appearance. Understand you're new to the market. I am. I've only been here in Charlotte for about the last three months or so. so. Where are you from? Uh, Originally from New York City. I did my training up at University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia and in Chicago, and so I'm coming here from the Midwest. All right, you're from Chicago. It's where it's quite cold right now. It is. It's a little <laughs> well, bit different little weather chilly. down here. Yeah. <laughs> and Dr. Springer, where are you from? Uh, originally, I'm from uh, Annapolis, Maryland. I mm-hmm. uh, did my training at the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota and uh, my fellowship at Harvard in Boston, so also accustomed to some cold weather. Uh, I was going to say, and how long have you been here? I've been here six years now. All right. Now, Ortho Carolina, uh, it's a big operation, many offices. So where are you? Where do you practice? Uh, Dr. Sheth and I are located uh, on our office uh, next to Mercy Hospital on mm-hmm. Vale Avenue, and we're a part of the Ortho Carolina Hip and Knee Center. Very good. That's the new building. That's right there on Correct. Caswell. And it's in the Elizabeth neighborhood. And uh, thank you so much for bringing your expertise today. They have brought us slides. They have also brought us some instruments for us to look at here, or or I should say some um, little models so we can fully understand what they will be talking about. So let's get right into the topic. First question, why would someone need a knee or hip replacement? Well, there's a lot of reasons that someone may need uh, hip and knee replacements. The most common thing that we think about is arthritis. Mm-hmm. And arthritis is somewhat of a general term that means inflammation of the joint. And the most common thing that we think about is osteoarthritis or the, the wear and tear type of degeneration that happens in the joint over time. Okay, we have some slides to this. So let's go to the first one if we can. As Dr. Springer and Dr. Sheth explain to us the need for a hip or knee replacement. It seems like we're hearing more and more people who actually need to have this done. Is that correct? Yeah, that is. uh, If you look at um, over the last uh, decade or so, uh, we're at probably close to about 600,000 total knee replacements and probably 250,000 total hip replacements that we do annually in the United States. And we've looked at um, there's actually been a big paper that was written a few years ago that looked at 2030. So we're looking 20 years out now um, and we're looking at maybe doing three and a half million total knee replacements in the United States and mm. probably 600,000 total hips. So I think as our pa- patient population gets older, um, the need for total hip and knee replacements is going to continue to increase. Wow. And it's going to double by 2020. Boomeritis, is that what you're calling it? Boomeritis is a, is a, a, a term that, that, uh, that I read in the newspaper a couple of years back. You know, this January of 2011, the first baby boomer will turn 65. Yes. And we know about the exponential growth in that age group in the population. Mm-hmm. And of course, those are the most common patients that we're doing joint replacements on. And um, I, I think it's important that people understand the impact that arthritis has uh, on the community. It is the number one cause of disability in the United States. The number one reason why people miss work or suffer from disability in the United States is actually arthritis. And you, when you hear that, Dr. Seth, is mm-hmm. there a, is there a way to prevent arthritis? I mean, there's not, um, I don't think there's a way to prevent it. Uh, there are, as Brian was saying, osteoarthritis is the most common thing that we see. Uh, the other component that we also see is some people who have had injuries either to their hip or their knee before and they wind up getting something called post-traumatic arthritis. So basically they've had an injury that injures the cartilage at the time of their injury, and as a result will go on to get arthritis and wearing away of that cartilage. So that may be preventatory uh, or preventive with regards to um, not having an injury. But there's other types of arthritis, either inflammatory-based, which are from autoimmune disorders, such as like rheumatoid arthritis, yeah. um, that you can't really prevent. And osteoarthritis, right. I think there's a huge genetic component to it. Because uh, we'll see patients who are 80 years old who have run marathons their whole life and come in with knees that look perfect um, mm. without any arthritis. Right. So there's definitely a genetic component to it as well. Well, let's say that you have been informed about having a possible arthritis in your future because of hereditary uh, means. 
Can you exercise to, to ward that off? I think probably one of the biggest things is um, maintaining your weight and not gaining weight, which puts a lot of excess stress on your lower joints, including both your hip and your knee. Okay. Uh, I think exercise when you're doing low impact or no impact exercises, such as swimming or um, using the elliptical machine, the bike, doing those kind of things will help maintain mobility of your joints without really putting a lot of stress across your joints. Um, and that's probably, I think, the best things that you can do to sort of maybe maintain your function without doing too much damage to your joints. But again, there's a genetic component because there are people who still run and do sort of high impact loading mm -hmm. and that don't get arthritis. Yeah. Yeah. And we just had a big marathon here in the area. And for those people who do run, can they strengthen their their knees or their hips by running? Or is it is that pounding not eventually going to be a good thing for them? Well, I think is is as Dr. Sheth was describing, there, there's, there are certain people who are probably predisposed to developing arthritis. And I don't think we really truly understand the full spectrum of why people develop arthritis. Why does a patient in their early 40s develop arthritis as to, opposed to the example that he gave the 80-year-old marathon runner who's mm -hmm. never had any problems with their joint. It's clear from the, from the studies that, that weight and obesity are a major contributing factor. Bottom line is most runners aren't overweight yeah. or obese. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of factors that play into it. Some people would argue that the repetitive pounding on the joint maybe isn't necessarily a good thing. But again, they're often not overweight patients. So um, of the modifiable factors that we can control, clearly it's weight and exercise and maintaining the strength around the joint. And, and we think nutrition plays a role as well. Hmm. Antioxidants in your diet and things like that all may have a protective effect on the cartilage. So there's really a lot of things that once patients are diagnosed with arthritis that they can do to help prevent or maybe maybe not prevent but slow down the right. progression of the disease hmm. over time. All right. You mentioned diet. Are there particular foods that we should consider? Uh, you know, I think a lot of patients that I've seen, I, I'll actually refer them back to a nutritionist uh, or a diet uh, or a diet specialist with their primary care physician to get a sense of what their diet c is composed of and to see where they can make changes in their lifestyle to help them lose weight. Because the problem that we run into, I think, uh, and I think Dr. Spring will agree in general, is that you have patients who want to be active, who have hip or knee pain, who have arthritis, um, but they can't be active because of the pain. So now they're, they yep. really have to make a change in their lifestyle and try to lose weight that way. Yeah. And it's and hard tough. to, and it's, it's, a, it's sort of a, a little bit of a vicious circle, but mm -hmm. uh, I think having, so far just in the last few months that I've been here, I think I've seen some results with people going back and seeing a diet, a diet specialist and a nutritionist mm -hmm. to say, let me make a lifestyle change and see if that'll help. Okay, you mentioned antioxidants. Any type of foods that you can think of? Well, I think obviously, as with anything, if we talk about whether it's heart disease or diabetes or any chronic medical problem, just maintaining a healthy balanced diet is important. You know, there's a lot of information and maybe a lot of misinformation out there about supplements and glucosamine and all these types of things that perhaps don't have a lot of scientific um, basis for their use when clearly if you maintain a healthy um, diet with fruits and vegetables and, and a good balance, um, there are naturally occurring antioxidants in those that people can use without having to spend the money on a lot of these supplements that are advertised. A good diet. Yep. A good diet. Good, good food sources. All right, next slide if we can. The joint replacement surgery. Well, let's get right into it. Uh, this kind of spells it out. Dr. Uh, Springer? Sure. This is a little bit what Dr. Sheth uh, uh, talked about earlier, which is currently in this country, um, we're approaching probably nearly a million joint replacements a year uh, in the United States. And, and as we talked about earlier with the, with the way that the population is heading with the demographics and the baby boomers turning 65, and you look at some of these numbers that, that were mentioned, a 600% increase in the total knee replacements and a 300% increase in the total hip replacements. Uh, I mean, for, this, this, for us, this is a little bit of job security, mm -hmm. but this is, a, this is a staggering number, these projections of the number of joints that are going to need to be done in this country. And the, some of the concern is, is the workforce there. Is, are we going to have, are there enough of us around to do these with, mm -hmm. these, with these number of increases? And, um, you know, so there's, there's a lot of concern about the, the, the volume of joint replacements that's going to have to be done over time in this country. 
All right, the next several slides actually are MRIs, I believe. So let's go to the next one. And, and what are we looking at here? What is that dot right in the middle, first off? Let's explain. Yeah, so this is, a, uh, this is an x-ray looking at um, a patient's pelvis. Uh, that dot in the center is actually a marker ball that we put on all of our patients, especially our new patients that come to see us. And this allows us to actually size the bone when we are uh, preparing for surgery and templating uh, a patient's um, size for their, uh, for their thigh bone as well as their pelvis to get us a sense of what size implants we would use in the operating room. So this is sort of a, um, gives us a, an idea before we go in the operating room and uh, gives us an idea of what size we would be using so we can kind of plan ahead of time. And, and this know, is for what, a hip replacement? For a hip replacement. This x-ray here is pretty much a normal x-ray of a hip. Um, and what we look at to say that it's normal is if you look at both sides, the sort of the little black space between uh, the two bones, between the thigh mm -hmm. bone uh, around the hip joint and the pelvis is a, um, is cartilage, mm -hmm. and so you can see that there's cartilage on both sides of the hip. So it's, and that is a healthy That is a healthy body. looking hip joint. All right, yeah. let's go to the next slide if we can. Is and this, so I don't you, see that clear space. Correct, so if you look at the hip on the, on the left side of the screen, you can see that there's no cartilage space anymore. Now this has actually destroyed a little bit of the bone, both on the, on the uh, head of the femur or the thigh bone as well as into the pelvis. Uh, so this is pretty severe end-stage osteoarthritis uh, of that hip. And it looks like that person is leaning as well. A little bit. Um, part of, part, partly what happens with arthritis is this happens over years. This doesn't happen overnight. And as a result, the rest of your body, including your pelvis as well as your lower spine, will compensate for that. Mm. And that may help make, give us that picture that they're leaning and trying to compensate for some of that loss in height or loss of the cartilage that you see on, the, on that side. All right. And the next slide. What so, do we have here? So this next slide is, is really what we've been looking at, but this is a nice side-to-side -side comparison so the audience can see really what the difference is between a normal hip and what an arthritic hip looks like. And as we, as we just talked about, if and you the look normal at the, hip is on the left. The normal hip would be on the left. So you see the hip joint, of course, is a ball and socket joint. And there's, a, there's clearly a separation between that ball and socket joint. Mm -hmm. And that separation is not just an air separation. That's where the, the cushion or the cartilage of the joint resides. And when you look at the, the pathologic hip on your right or the arthritic hip on your right, essentially what you see is the loss of that cartilage space or the loss of that cartilage cushion. It looks like one big mass. It looks like one big mass, almost as if the bones have come together to form mm -hmm. one bone. And that, that's a very characteristic pattern for an osteoarthritic hip. Ugh, and that appears to be painful, is it? Very painful. Mm -hmm. Very painful. And very limiting for patients as well. All right, the next slide. What is this? So sometimes um, patients will have a disease of their hip from when they were born in the sense that their hip never formed properly. Uh -huh. um, and as a result, uh, the way I think it's easiest to explain to patients is if you, have, if you had four wheels on a, on a car and three of them were perfectly round and one was sort of oval shaped or misshaped, you'd be, it'd be easy to tell which one's going to wear out quicker. Um, and so if you look at both hips on this, uh, on this patient, uh, they were not formed properly, so you basically have sort of a square peg in a round hole, and so it's going to uh, it's going to wear out much earlier. Um, and most of these patients are usually younger patients; they're usually in their 30s or 40s when they come in uh, with these type of X-rays. They don't usually make it till their 60s or 70s without mm. having symptoms. Okay. And it'll be the same type of symptoms where they've got a lot of pain in their groin, um, and uh, that's really again because the cartilage is worn away. Mm. Then in the next slide actually shows how someone can get some help, right? Mm -hmm. Correct. So this is, this is a, a radiographic example of what a hip replacement looks like. The, the, the picture in the middle is also just a graphic depiction of, of what a hip replacement looks like. The photo all the way on the left, the, the radiograph, the x-ray obviously shows that area of that cartilage being worn out. And essentially what a hip replacement is doing is it's replacing that ball and socket joint that is worn out with, with an artificial bearing surface. And we have, a, we have a model here that, that we can show that. Um, here on set. That, that may, look just a, may look a little bit uh, more accurate for patients to see at home. And essentially mm -hmm. what we're looking at, if I take these two apart, mm -hmm. on this side here is basically what we're looking at is the socket side of the ball and socket joint. And that goes right into the bone. And that goes right into the bone, right. So essentially what happens is, is, is this titanium socket that's in the bone has a roughened surface, almost like a sandpaper surface on the back of it. And so when it's pressed into the bone, 
your bone is actually very dynamic and your bone will actually grow into that implant mm -hmm. and lock it into place. And then what we've placed on the inside there is a type of a liner, in this case it's plastic or what we call polyethylene liner, that acts and substitutes for the new cartilage that's missing. On the stem side, you can see what we've done is we've removed the, the diseased portion of the ball, of the ball and socket joint, and now there's a new ball on the end here. What material is this? This particular one, you can see it's a little bit of a pink color. This is actually a ceramic material, and there's various different options. The stem that actually goes down inside the bone, and this is just one example of many examples that are, are variable, is a wedge shape. And you can see it has a roughened surface on it. This would most likely be titanium. And when this is placed down inside of the bone, very much like on the socket side, your bone actually grows in and locks this into place. So in most cases, it doesn't need to be held into the bone with cement. Occasionally, we'll do that to lock it into place. Mm -hmm. And now when these two come back together, you can see we now have an artificial bearing surface of that ball moving inside of that new socket. And now that is in general a very pain-free motion for that patient. Mm. And, and that's as, essentially how a hip replacement works. And as far as where that meets, uh, that's gonna stay connected? Right, so, so the, the ball, as you can see, is placed inside the socket. But really what this model isn't showing and what really keeps this ball inside the socket is, of course, the muscles and the tension on the muscles and the mm -hmm. forces around the muscle that keep that ball inside the socket. And that way it still allows the patient to have that motion in their hip that they would need to do their, their activities of daily living. And as a result of that, I would think that the therapy post-surgery is so important and the recovery. Absolutely, just like anything we talk about with any joint replacement, uh, the therapy is really the most critical portion of a joint replacement. I always tell my patients it's the hardest part of the surgery is what starts after the surgery. How long does it take for someone? Well, it's variable. It's different for different patients and it's, it's sometimes hard because um, you know patients want a definitive answer, but every patient's different. That 80-year-old mm -hmm. that may, may be cover a little bit slower than the 45-year-old with a joint replacement. Yeah. Um, in general, by about a year, most of them are doing very similar. On average, we tell patients about six weeks, roughly, six to eight weeks to feel like they're back up on their feet and going. Mm -hmm. But really, the recovery continues out even for a year after a joint replacement, they continue to make progress and make strides. We have a caller, so let's go ahead and take a, a call since we're talking about hip replacement here in the first part of the hour. We'll be uh, talking about knee replacement here in the second part of the show. John from Charlotte, welcome to uh, HealthWise. Hi, John, you with us? Yes, hello. Hi, hi. what's your question? Hi, uh, my first name is Joan. Hi, Joan, what's your question? Yes. I had hip replacements, both hips, on 1990. I'm 82 years old now. They gave me a life expectancy of these hips of 20 years. Mm. And every once in a while, I get pains in both hips. Mm. And I go to my doctor, and he gives me uh, uh, an injection in both hips. Uh, is that wise to keep getting uh, injections in my hips? And you've and, had them replaced. Pardon? And you've had them replaced. Is that what you said? Yes, both of them. And how long ago was that? 1990. All right, so 20 years ago, 20 plus years. Let's hear what they have to say. Thank you for the question. Dr. Seth, I think he's going to address yeah. you, Joan. Um, yes. One question, Joan, do you, uh, have you had x-rays done of your hip? Oh, yes. Okay, and everything seems to be... Everything seems to be in, in the proper position. Nothing has changed. Well, they looked perfect last time. It Good. Was approximately nine months ago. Okay. Do you get x-rays every year? Yes. Excellent. And these injections, they're giving to, are you they giving these injections on the side of your hip? Uh, I believe it's uh, the doctor gives me in the bone. It, it's not too often. It's every once in a while. Okay. I think the cold weather here in North Carolina recently has a lot to do with it. Do you think so, doctor? It's possible. Um, I don't know. I'm from Chicago, so the weather's not that cold, so I don't think that's the answer. Um, the, uh, the most likely, the, the injections that you're probably getting are probably for a small fluid-filled sac that's yes, on the side exactly. of your hip. I don't know if you can see from this model here, um, if this is your 
hip replacement, there's a small fluid-filled sac that sits out right here. Yes. And sometimes, um, over time, if you've had arthritis in your hips, you could have arthritis in your back. Yes, and that I might do change the, a little bit of the way how you walk over time. Yes. And sometimes. I already had a, a replacement of my shoulder okay. on the left side. Well, I think sometimes you put some excess str uh, stress and tension on some of these tissues, and that might give you some pain. And so if you're getting these injections just periodically, it's not a bad idea, I think, to help reduce some of the pain um, and to help you get back to function. So I think it's okay. Hey, Joan, listen, thank you so much. She sounds like the bionic woman. She does, absolutely. <laughs> having the shoulder replacement and now the hip replacements. And 20 years in, uh, here she's having these injections. Mm -hmm. But for the hip replacements to last that long, is that typical? It's not unusual. Um, you know, we're as... As we continue to evolve the science behind joint replacements and our bearing technologies, the parts that rub against each other get better, hip replacements are becoming more resistant to wear. And keep in mind that Joan had technology that's now 20 years old and she has a hip replacement that's 20 years old. It appears that she's having x-rays and the most important thing I think for Joan is that she gets those yearly x-rays mm -hmm. to make sure they're not showing any excessive wear. Um, while there's no guarantees, I don't think it would be unreasonable for patients nowadays with the technology that we have to expect a joint replacement to last 20 plus years, mm -hmm. maybe even 30 years. We, again, it's hard to tell an individual patient right. that, but we think our technology is getting to that point. Okay, so what you're saying is that from 20 years ago, there's, there's new technology since then, Dr. Sheth. Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, what Dr. Springer is talking about is that majority of... Uh, I think of the new changes that we've seen in joint replacement is really not the fundamentals of hip replacement or knee replacement. A lot of the fundamentals and biomechanics and sort of the engineering behind it has been pretty much the same. Um, it's, it's, and it's really more of the bearing surfaces between because I think long term when we look at joint replacement, the biggest problem that we have is the longevity of the implant. How long will this implant stay uh, in a patient and be functional for them? And so it is not uncommon to see someone from the 1990s have a hip replacement that lasts 20 years. And again, like Dr. Springer was saying, we try to look at these every year or every two years to make sure that we don't find this patient once they have a very serious problem and we were able to catch it early on. And if we have to do something about it, we can take care of it. We're going to stay in Charlotte. We have Marie with us now. Hi, Marie. Hi, how are you? Good. How are you doing? I'm doing fine, thank you. What's your question for Dr. Springer and Dr. Seth? Well, I think my question was just answered by Joan, the uh, previous caller, asking how long a joint replacement lasts. Because in, in 2002, I had a right knee replacement, oh, right and I was knee concerned re about how long an, uh, a replacement lasts. So I think I kind of got my answer from Joan, the previous caller. Well, Joan was uh, a recipient of a hip replacement, so let's hear what they have to say about knee replacement. And we're going to be talking about knees here in the second half of the show, so stick around, okay? Let's Thank hear what you. they have to say, Marie. Thanks. Thank you. Does that apply also for knee replacement? I, I think it does. I think, uh, again, as we, as, we, as we said earlier, it's, it's very difficult to tell an individual patient how long their joint replacement is going to last them. So when we look at large groups of patients that have had joint replacements done and we follow them over time, we generally say the failure rate is roughly about 1% per year. So at 20 years, maybe 80% or more should still be functioning well. And I think that holds true for hips and knees. And again, as our technology advances, and certainly a knee that was done in 2002 had good technology, um, we think these implants may, again, last into the second and third decade. Uh, the most important thing, of course, is that you have your joint replacement periodically surveyed, even if you're not having significant problems with it, to come in to talk to your surgeon that did your knee replacement and to have it x-rayed, because sometimes we can see subtle hints of wear or things that are concerning that may make us then want to follow you a little bit closely. Or conversely, we may say, hey, at 10 years, 12 years, your knee x-rays look fantastic. I don't see anything concerning here. You can come back and see me in another three to five years. All right, Marie, there you go. We thank you so much for that. We have a couple more slides to get in before we go to our break. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, let's see what we have to see here. We're also going to talk about uh, some complications of this hip replacement surgery. But first, that shows how this is how it's placed. We saw the model here on set. Dr. Seth, uh, go ahead and pick it up. Yeah, so what, this is... Uh, 
This is an x-ray, again, of uh, someone who's had a hip replacement. Um, and what that shows is uh, there's a cup that's been put into the pelvis, like Dr. Springer showed before with the model. And there are two screws that have actually been put in through the cup into the bone. And that usually will help with initial stability of the cup when you put it in. And for the most part, not everyone uses screws and you don't have to. But sometimes uh, surgeons will put a couple of screws in just to, for good measure almost, just to make sure that this will ingrow in the backside of that cup will, uh, will be stable enough for the, for the bone to grow into it. Um, again, the, there's a stem in, inside the bone on the thigh bone. And on that side, again, this is a different model than what Dr. Springer showed with regards to the stem, but the same concept. There's fi it's fixed to the bone. There's a little sleeve there that the bone will grow into. And again, it looks like a nice stable construct. All right, let's go to the next slide. And we are addressing complications after hip replacement because we're going to look at both sides of this issue here, some of the risk and then the complications, Dr. Springer. Sure. I think it's, I think it's important as we talk about all the wonderful things about joint replacements that, that, that patients also understand there can be risks and there can be complications. And so we've put up uh, a, a few photos here of, of a few of them. All the way on your left is a is a complication, what we call dislocation, or simply the ball popping out of the socket. And you can see that. And you can see that. And, and so there's Is that no easily put back in? Uh, in general, yes. Um, it does generally require uh, sedation or anesthesia to put it back in. Oftentimes, okay. does not require uh, an additional surgery. Mm -hmm. Although sometimes the rule is once it happens once, it tends to be easier to happen again. Mm. A lot of times this can be uh, from occasionally putting your hip in an abnormal or an unnatural um, position. Mm -hmm. um, this is something that we think is declining as our technology improves. Good. Um, historically, the dislocation rate has been roughly around 3 to 5 percent uh, of, of patients, and I think that's becoming less as our technology improves. What's the center one? The center x-ray shows a condition called osteolysis or wear of a joint replacement. And th this is where, um, as the bearing surfaces wear, just as if you rub any two artificial parts against each other, there can be debris that generates in the joint. And your body recognizes that debris as being foreign. Mm. And when your body tries to deal with getting rid of that debris, sometimes it can cause an abnormal reaction to the bone around the implant. Mm. Again, with the technology that we see, these bearing surfaces are much more resistant to wear than what they used to be. So we hope this is gonna become less of a problem. This is generally something we would see at 15, 20 plus years out. Again, the importance of showing this would be uh, for those patients that have hip replacements that are beyond a decade old, that they have their hip periodically x-rayed so that we can pick this up on an x-ray and something that we can follow. And then the last picture? The last one is simply would be a, an extreme, a traumatic event, which would be if someone were to fall or have an extreme injury and break the bone around the implant. Uh. Yep. All right. Well, the hour is quickly flying by. When we return, we will be discussing the knee replacement. You're enjoying HealthWise on WTVI. An educational grant for HealthWise is provided by Ortho Carolina, a comprehensive orthopedic practice with locations throughout the Charlotte region. And viewers like you, thank you. If you would like support group information about tonight's topic or any other HealthWise topic, call SupportWorks at 704-331-9500. And we're examining what's new in hip and knee replacement. Joining us are doctors from Ortho Carolina right here in Charlotte. We welcome Dr. Brian Springer and Dr. Neil Seth. And Dr. Seth is recently moved here from Chicago, originally yep. from New York City. And Dr. Springer is from Annapolis, Maryland. He did not go to the Naval Academy, did he? <laughs> No, but they did win yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> Big game, Army, Navy. Um, and uh, he also has those roots of pulling for Navy, but you actually went to school where and uh, uh, medical school? Uh, I did my medical school in West Virginia at Marshall University. I did my residency at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, and my fellowship um, in Boston at Harvard. So you did go to Marshall, Thundering Herd. That's right. Did you play football right. there? I did not. All right. <laughs> Fortunate for them. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good to have both of you in Charlotte. We welcome you, the viewer, for being with us once again on WTVI's HealthWise. We've been exploring what's new in technology with hip replacement. And uh, now we're going to shift over to knee replacement. And there's some new technologies here, including minimally invasive approaches. Uh, but first, I have to ask you, when you hear the term bum knee, what does that mean to you? 
Well, that's a very, very common term, and I think it can mean a lot of different things, anything from a sports injury to just the, the typical person walking around, the weekend warrior that may injure their knee or working out at the gym or uh, all the way to the person that may have a, a, a badly arthritic knee that needs a knee replacement. Mm. So I think that bum knee kind of covers the spectrum of, of injuries. Do patients come in and actually say, gee, doc, I have a bum knee? Sometimes they do. <laughs> they're, they're not sure what it is, and you get an x-ray and you get a sense of what what's going on with them, you can have a discussion as to what that bum knee really means. Now, we saw the stats at the top of the show as to what we think the uh, the boomer, what how, what you call them, the boomer? Boomeritis. Yeah, boomeritis with hip replacement. Are we seeing the same with knee replacement too? Absolutely, even more same so. Same forecast, the even same projections, more so. even more Probably. so. Because we're just, we're just pounding these joints? Absolutely, and I think, uh, you know, we just demographically, we tend to do more, more knees than hip replacements, probably two, if not three to one. And so we're seeing an, this exponential rise in the number of knee replacements that wow. we're doing. So tell us, Dr. Seth, I mm -hmm. understand that you have been involved with a new approach with the minimally invasive. Is it's, this new to Charlotte? It's not, it's, it's not really a new approach. Um, I think in general, uh, I think you do as much, uh, you, do, you make the approach as big as you need to in order to do the procedure safely. Mm -hmm. um, and I think probably the thing that's really very different uh, in general is, and I think Dr. Springer uses the same thing, is really the post-op rehab and protocol that we're using uh, to get patients up and out of, out of the hospital quicker, as well as the pain uh, regimen that we're using. Okay. People just don't stay in the hospital anymore for pain. I mean, most of our patients are going home maybe one or two days after surgery, and it has really nothing to do with the approach, but it's, I think it's the full multi, um, sorry, multimodal pain, and, um, pain regimen that we're using, as well as sort of a multidisciplinary approach to these patients from preoperatively from anesthesia, intraoperatively during surgery, as well as postoperatively with physical therapist, rehab, as well as, again, the postoperative pain. So most patients are not taking IV narcotics. They're not staying in the hospital for a week anymore. I think that's probably the biggest change um, uh, that we've done probably in the last decade, I think, in joint replacement. Right, and, and with these procedures, you're getting them up and walking sooner, too, are you not, Dr. Right. Springer? Absolutely, and that, that's really the most critical thing. If patients have good pain control, they're going to get out of bed faster, they're going to rehab faster, they're going to cut down on the risk of developing blood clots and pneumonia, we're going to get them out of the mm -hmm. hospital in two or three days. Um, so really a lot of that stems from, as Dr. Sheth was talking about, this kind of multimodal approach to the yeah. patients, where it's not just the size of the incision or the techniques, but it's the all-encompassing. Uh, everything from mm. their education when they first make that decision yeah. to have a joint replacement all the way through their hospitalization and their rehabilitation. Yeah. All right, let's go to the arthritic knee. And we do have some callers, so stay with us, callers. We're going to just do a couple of slides here with what the arthritic knee will look like, very similar to what the hip looked like. That on the left is normal. I can see that. But on the right, arthritis? Yeah, so if you look at the normal side, again, you see that black stripe sort of almost going all the way across the knee. And that, again, is not air, but that's that cartilage cushion between the femur or the thigh bone and your, your tibia or your shin bone on the bottom part. If you look at the x-ray on the right, you can see that there's cartilage on the outside part of the knee, but on the inside part of the knee, this patient is bone on bone. So now there's mm. no uh, cartilage space anymore. And once again, is that painful to the patient? It is. I mean, now you're rubbing bone on bone. You have no cushion in between. So as you're doing any type of activities, mostly walking or going up and down stairs or sitting for a long period of time and standing, they'll get stiffness in that knee and they'll start having pain. Okay. And then the next slide, how does joint replacement work? Very similar to what we saw with knee re with uh, hip replacement. Yep. yep. So again, there's that same X-ray on the way left. And now in the middle, there's a uh, there's a diagram of what a knee replacement looks like. Um, and on the on the way right is an evident as an X-ray of what a, a knee replacement looks like. Um, if I can show this model. Yep. To give a sense of what exactly we have a we close do. up here on set. Go ahead. Dr. Uh, Seth, it, it, it'll take us just a second to okay. find it. But your sure. point here is, there we go. So basically, this is, again, this is sort of the center picture of what the, what the model looks like of a knee replacement. And what we're essentially doing is, if we were to take all these components out, what we're doing here is, on the end of the thigh bone, we make cuts in the bone to get rid of all the disease cartilage. We do the same thing on the top of the, the shin bone. And essentially, we were capping the end of the bone like you cap a tooth. We put cement on, and we put this, this piece of metal right here, which acts as the, the top part of your knee replacement. Hmm. And we do the same thing on the bottom part, where we put cement down, and we put another, again, we put this metal component. And you can't have metal rubbing on metal, so we have this fancy piece of plastic in between, and that becomes your new knee replacement. 
and the pain supposedly goes away as a result right. of this? Exactly. So before, you know, your knee originally used to be bone, cartilage, bone. We've lost the cartilage, so now you're bone on bone. We replaced it with metal, plastic on metal, and it's not the same as what you had before. However, it's better than having bone on bone, which was rubbing and causing a lot of pain. Let's go over to Denver. We have Carl with us now. Hi, Carl. Welcome to the show. Hi there. I appreciate you taking my call. What's your question? Quick question. I do have a dual hip replacement. I've had every test done, and it's absolutely necessary. This is a follow-up to about six years ago, having core decompression on both hips, and I'm unfortunately facing dual hip replacement. Uh, I would like to have an answer, someone to tell me the difference in what they are telling me is a relatively new procedure that doesn't require the cutting of the muscle where they go in between the muscle to do the hip replacement. And my doctor that I currently have does not do that procedure, uh, but he has said, you know, you may be benefit from this, and, and I just don't do it, and I'm more than willing to get you with someone that does, and I'm just asking the doctors, I hate to leave my doctor, but I would like to know what they think would be the absolute better approach uh, to the hip replacement. I didn't hear them cover that uh, in the hip replacement section. Thank you. It's a great question, and thank you for that question. It's all part of the education here. So what is the difference in the procedures? Sure. Dr. Springer is going to address you first, Carl. Carl, Carl that's, a, that's a great question, and it's something that, that is uh, becoming ever increasingly popular here in the last couple of years in hip replacement. And essentially what your surgeon is talking to you about is something that's called a direct anterior approach to the hip. He's not talking about a change in the type of implants that go in. He's simply talking about a different way to get into the hip joint. And essentially, there's three ways that the surgeon can get into the hip joint. Uh, through the backside, or what we call a posterior approach, through the central aspect of the hip, and what we call a lateral approach, and then through an incision in the front of the hip joint, which is called a direct anterior approach. Some of it is, is, is based on surgeon's familiarity. Uh, the direct anterior approach has gained popularity um, in, in, in the recent years because of its um, theoretical advantage of having less muscle damage uh, or less tissue damage and then potentially a quicker recovery. Um, I don't know as of yet that we have truly the data to suggest um, that that is necessarily true from, from what, what we've been doing traditionally. Um, it, it appears to be that it is, a, it is a, a little bit more of a technically challenging surgery. Um, to be honest with you, Carl, I think the most important thing you said to me was, I hate to leave my doctor. And, and what I tell my patients is probably more important than, than picking the implants or where the incision is, is, is you should really spend your time researching and looking at your doctor. Because when, it, when soups comes to nuts, the most important thing is that you have a doctor that's well trained in doing your joint replacement and all the other factors may not be as important as as picking your surgeon and you have to really respect that surgeon for saying hey look if you've heard about this and i may not uh en endorse it or be that familiar with it go out and research it so that's exactly why he's calling are you finding doctors within your practice are using this approach are you personally using this approach uh, I personally am not, um, simply because I haven't seen the science yet to mm -hmm. support a need um, to change. Um, I do agree with your, um, with what Carl was saying, that it, it's important, this is such an important decision for you, Carl, that, that it never hurts to research this a little bit further, to go talk to different doctors, get second opinions. I encourage all my patients to do it, because I think if we're telling you the right thing, you should hear that same thing from multiple doctors. Mm -hmm. Dr. Seth, your thoughts? Same thing. I, I think, um, Carl, one of the important things, again, uh, that has already been uh, iterated by Dr. Springer is that uh, you want to make sure that your surgeon does what he or she is comfortable doing. Uh, you don't want them to do a procedure that they're not used to doing just to try to appease what you want. Uh, and I think the right thing to do is that if you are interested in having a specific procedure, and you are a candidate for that procedure, then to get you the right person who does it a, does it a lot. Um, I personally do not use a direct anterior approach, and again, it's for the same reason that Dr. Springer was saying, is that I don't know the data yet as to if this is really better. Um, I think doing a posterior approach, and if you do it done correctly, and if that's what you're more comfortable with, I can more reproducibly do that with a hip replacement and get my patients back to the level of function that they desire. Carl, listen, thank you so much for that question. A great one. Let's now head down to Monroe. Kim's with us. Hi, Kim. Hi, Kim. You with us? Yes. Hi. What's your question? 
Um, I had hip surgery, uh, hip, total hip replacement back in 2004. 2004? Okay. Uh-huh. Okay. And I was 49 years old. Oh. And um, my doctor put it off for like five years, but it's like I have osteoarthritis. Uh, right. And it was like bone to bone. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm just wondering, now I'm having problems with my right hip. All right. Let me ask you something. Are you glad you went ahead and had the procedure at this young age? Yeah. Um, I can walk. I could walk the next day. I was ready to go home. They had some minor uh, complications. Um, mm -hmm. If I have surgery, I have minor complications. But your quality of life improved, and you were, you were glad you went ahead and, and did it at this young age. But now you said you're starting to experience some complications or some issues? Yes. Okay, let's hear what they have to say to that, okay? Thanks for the call. Who wants to take Kim's question here? Uh, Kim, can I just clarify? You, you're having trouble with your, with your hip replacement, or is it with the opposite side that you're now having troubles with? I believe she has dropped, so she cannot answer that okay. question. But we, from what we learned from that call, how, yeah. could, how would we address her? Well, I think there, there's a lot of issues that, um, that have to be taken into consideration. Clearly, she's young. She's younger than the average patient in this country that has a hip replacement, which is, on average, about 63 years old. And historically, if, if she was in an orthopedist's office 20 years ago at the age of 49, they would have said, I'm, I'm sorry, Kim, you're too young to have a mm -hmm. hip replacement. You need to wait absolutely as long as you can. And I think that philosophy has changed. As our implants have gotten better, we feel more confident doing this surgery in younger patients if the indications are there. But secondly, what we see are those patients that absolutely waited till the bitter end. They tended to lose so much of their quality of life waiting mm -hmm. to have a joint replacement that they can never really catch back up and regain that quality of life mm -hmm. for the reason that they wanted to have a joint replacement in the first place. So it's a it's a very delicate interaction with the patient and the surgeon deciding when is the right time to do a joint replacement. Right. And with her, with her complications now or with her issues, I think she said, what, osteoarthritis? Osteoarthritis. How would you address that? What well, would be advice there? I think the, the most important thing would be to uh, make sure she goes in and sees her surgeon to make sure that the, the hip replacement that was replaced looks appropriate on the, on the side that she had done. And if she's having troubles on the other side, it's important to see what type of conservative management she's tried so far, um, such as anti-inflammatories, uh, physical therapy, et cetera, and then determine really when is the best time for her to go forward with a joint replacement on the other side. All right. Violet from Clover, welcome to the HealthWise Show. How can we help? What's your question for Dr. Brian Springer and Dr. Neil Sleth? Well, uh, I had hip replacement on the right hip Yes. August the 10th of this year. All right. Okay. The surgery went fine. Uh, my hip, he did the x-rays and said the hip was fine. But but I cannot lift my leg straight up at all. Mm. And you have you been doing the therapy? Yes, sir, for a long time. All right. And so your question is, what, uh, four oh, months have passed. How long is it going to take before you can right. actually have the mobility you right. want? Well, see, I have numbness from my knee down inside. Oh. Uh. Let's hear what they have to say, okay, Violet? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Is this a complication? Is this an well, issue? Or is this common? A couple of things that can happen. Um, Violet, are you able to walk without your knee buckling? Well, it, sometimes it tries to buckle. But right now I'm walking with a, a cane. Okay. A four-pronged cane, uh -huh. which helps tremendously, you Good. know. But, hey. uh, you know, sometimes I hold on to stuff, the bar and stuff. You I know, understand. But, but and you're and you're still doing your therapy actively? Well, some, yes. I do a lot. <laughs> are you still going to therapy or are you doing therapy on your no, own I at have home? Been, I'm doing it on my, on my own. Okay. And do you think your strength is getting better or staying the same? Well, I don't understand why the numbness is still in my leg. Uh-huh. They now my doctor he did the x rays and said that it went everything went great. Right. And uh I have been told that it the feeling would come back eventually. Where's the numbness? From the inside of my knee down. Down? Yeah, on the inside of my leg. Okay. And, and I have a, I've had an MRI to check about my back. And your back is okay? And it's fine. There ain't nothing wrong with my back whatsoever. Okay. And I have to have a shower because I can't get down in a tub. 
Right. Okay. <laughs> um, I think in general, sometimes there can be some injuries to the nerves around the hip when you have hip replacement surgery, and it's uh -huh. not because you've actually injured it or cut the nerve. Right. But m sometimes there's some stretching of the nerve that goes on just from the procedure itself, and that can take several months to get better. I mean, that yeah. can take four to six months, even longer. Yeah. Uh, as long as you're making progress and you're going forward, it, it might take a long time, but as long as you're moving in the right direction, I think it'll probably continue to get better. Um, well, well, but, would that make it be it hard to walk, too, because of the numbness itself? It, it could. Not not just from the numbness, but the numbness in that where you're saying that you have the numbness comes from a nerve that's above it, um, and that gives uh, well, some of the... Well, it's in my knee, too. It's in my knee, too. Okay. Yeah. Um, so it's the same nerve that gives some, some of the function in your leg as well as some of the sensation that you're having right. or lack of sensation in the inside right. part of your uh, knee. Right. Uh, so that can give you some difficulties with walking and potentially having that knee buckle. And get inside. In, I, see, I, I slept in the recliner till just recently. Okay. <laughs> From all that time because I couldn't get in and out of my bed. I understand. And uh, see, I'm a diabetic, and I have to get up and use the bathroom a good bit too, you know. Right. But um, otherwise, I'm okay. You know, I just didn't know what would be causing it, but I understand and appreciate your answer you know but my doctor told me he said in time it will come back good well violet we thank you so much and you know we have we have addressed some nerve issues here on the air before the nerve seems to be the slowest part of the body to grow back so could this be some of the issue and you really do have to give it months before oh. that feeling comes back to where you would like for it to be is this true yeah it is true i mean i think uh especially depending on what type of approach you use to the hip um, I know Dr. Springer and I both use the posterior approach, and there's the big sciatic nerve which runs behind mm -hmm. the hip. For the most part, you don't even look for it. You know where it is. You keep it out of the way, right. and for the most part, it's fine. There are situations, one of the x-rays that we saw earlier on in the show, of someone who had a dysplastic hip where the hip didn't form properly. Mm -hmm. And when you do a hip replacement in that, it's a little bit tough sometimes to bring the hip back down to where it normally should be mm -hmm. because you're going to stretch that nerve out. Yeah. The nerve has been short for mm -hmm. you know, several years for that patient. And as a result, I think it's hard to do with that, you know, and knowing yeah. that that's a higher complication rate with so that. So advice for someone like Violet, continue the therapy? If I continue the therapy, if it's really not getting better, maybe to do some nerve testing to see mm -hmm. how the nerve is, is functioning All and right. if it's starting to come back or not. Okay, uh, let's see. Let's go back to the Queen City with Donna. Hi, Donna. What's your question for Dr. Springer and Dr. Seth? Hi, yes. Hi. Um, my question would be, I work in a dental practice in South Charlotte, and there's a constant debate in our office as to how long a patient needs to pre-medicate after great joint question. replacement. Just hoping I could get some clarification on uh, that. Oh, great question. The medical community, once again, tunes into the show. Let's hear what they have to say. Donna, that's a great question. I'll tell you, there's debate in our office about this as well. Um, and so there may not be a clear-cut answer, and there may actually be some discrepancy between what orthopedic surgeons say and, and what the recommendations are from the uh, American Dental Association. Mm -hmm. Historically, the agreement was is that when patients had hip or knee replacement, um, the risk, of course, is if you go to the dentist, if you have your teeth cleaned or you have any invasive dental work, we all have bacteria in our mouth. And of course, sometimes your gums bleed. Some of that bacteria can get into your system. And if you have these metal implants in your body, there's a chance that you could develop an infection from the spread of that bacteria. Whereas normally, if you don't have an implant, your body just simply fights it off and it goes away. So we do what we like to call prophylactic antibiotics, which is before you go to have any of these procedures done, such as a dental cleaning, we would give you a single dose of an oral antibiotic about an hour before you go to the dentist to help prevent the spread of that infection to your joint replacement. The initial recommendations from the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons and the American Dental Association was for the first two years after your joint replacement, even for a routine cleaning, that you would take these prophylactic antibiotics. And then beyond that, it would be for really high-risk surgeries, abscess tooth, things like that. About a year ago, a year and a half ago, our academy came out with a position statement that actually changed that and said, it's such low risk to take this single dose of antibiotics for dental cleaning. And occasionally we see that patients that's five years out, seven years out, 10 years out, and has an issue with their mouth, and they develop an infection, that it's such low risk to take this antibiotics that many of us now recommend it as a lifelong prophylactic. And I don't think the, 
I don't honestly know if, if, if the American Dental Association has changed their recommendations. From our standpoint, and the majority of us at Ortho Carolina, we now do a lifelong uh, dental protection. All right, Donna, great question. We thank you so much for phoning that in. We just have a few minutes. We have some callers. We're heading up to Salisbury now with Robert. Hi, Robert. Yes, sir. Hi, Robert. What's the question? Uh, the question is, I had a knee replacement in 2008, mm -hmm. and it did real well. In 2009, it got infected, mm. and then we had to take the knee out about five weeks ago. Now I'm on antibodies for six weeks, and hopefully around Christmas they're going to put a new knee in. My question is, how often does that happen, mm -hmm. and why did my knee get infected, or is it just something that happens? Right. I haven't had any... I hadn't had any problems with the dentist. I haven't had any sickness or cold or flu or anything. Let's hear what they have to say. Years. So it actually got infected a year after your procedure. Yes, sir. Okay, let's hear what they have to say. Thank you for the question. Who wants to take it, Dr. I'll Seth? Take it. Yeah, sure. Um, so, Robert, um, that's, uh, it's an unfortunate thing that the one thing that we do deal with on an elective procedure like total hip or knee replacement is infection. And that's really devastating to, I think, both the surgeon as well as the patient. Um, the, uh, the risk of infection probably in the United States is probably somewhere a little bit less than 1%. So that means one out of every uh, 100 patients may get an infection, even if you do the same thing every single time. And there are certain things that put you at higher risk if you're diabetic, if, you are, uh, if your immune system is not perfect, um, if you have some of these procedures that Dr. Springer was just talking about, either dental work or um, a colonoscopy or some other kind of procedure that might increase your risk of an infection. Um, Every now and then we do have patients who have had a joint replacement at time zero and at some point later, a year later, five years later, ten years later, come in with acute pain in their hip or in their knee and uh, have an infection. And we're, we're forced to take, the, take out the components and put something called a cement spacer, which is what you probably have in your knee right now. But what causes the infection, do we know? It's, it's hard to tell sometimes. Sometimes mm -hmm. they, they have been sick, sometimes they were in the hospital and they had some type of an infection mm -hmm. where the most likely at this point, it's because of something called hematogenous infection, which means there's bacteria that got into your bloodstream that has now seeded your joint replacement. Mm. Ah. Um, and that's probably what happened. Uh, and, for, and most of the time, it's not because your biology is wrong. It's just because there might have been some incident that happened, whether it's your dental work or some other procedure or something else. Uh, and sometimes we don't know why it happens. Yeah. Um, All right. We have a couple more slides, and I want to try to get to those very quickly. I think the very second to the last one, we haven't gotten up yet, Jerry. Let's look at that. How do joint replacement work? I, we might have had that up. But mm -hmm. then we had hip recall. Let's show that very quickly because this is all part of the complications and the risk. Why would there be a hip recall? Sure. This is, this is something that, that many of you have probably heard about. It's been quite frequently appearing on uh, commercials around the area and newspaper ads. Um, there was a, a particular company, uh, Johnson & Johnson. Johnson & Johnson's division of orthopedics is Depew. And on the socket side, uh, they had an implant that unfortunately had a higher risk of the bone not growing into the implant. Mm. And also some concerns with adverse wear from the metal against the metal bearing. So when there's a recall like this, do, how much of the population is affected and are they successful in replacement? Um, in, in this particular instance, the, the number of patients was relatively low when you look at all hip replacements. Mm -hmm. um, we are asking that patients that had this done, and in Ortho Carolina, we contacted all of our patients individually um, to let them know that they did have this implant. We asked them to come in to be x-rayed. The majority of them have done very well. The risk of failure in the United States is somewhere around 3%, so it's relatively low, but we're still asking that those patients be monitored. All right, and we have a minute and a half. I'm going to try to get in one more call. Let's go to uh, Paulette in Charlotte. Hi, Paulette. Very quickly, your question. Hi. Um, Hi. I've got kind of like a twofold. I was injured in 1990. Paulette, we just have about I a minute, have... so very quickly. I'm sorry? We just have about a minute. Can you very quickly ask your question? Okay, I've got a right knee replacement that um, has held fever, and they think it's been, it's just held infection the whole time oh. that I've had the replacement. Mm. And I know I have to have a new replacement on top of that one, uh. but I'm kind of scared at which point do I go to have it redone because I still have to have my left knee replaced. Okay, and let's hear what they have to say about that. Here we have another complication, okay. infection. So should she be apprehensive about having the other replaced and having this fixed? Well, I think... We just it, have a 
couple yeah, seconds. Sure. It's always a risk. It's a risk for anybody that undergoes joint replacement. The infection is there. It's that 1% to 2% that Dr. Sheff talked about. I think that your surgeon, knowing it's at a risk, maybe there are some issues that they can take to help lower that risk, but it's one of those unfortunate things that every patient has to face. All right, we are having to leave the, uh, the show with a full phone bank, so please go to the website, WTBI.org, to get in touch with these doctors. As always, we hope that this medical broadcast has helped you become more health-wise. We thank Dr. Brian Springer and Dr. Neil Seth of Ortho Carolina. Make it a great week. If you would like support group information about tonight's topic or any HealthWise topic, call SupportWorks at 704-331-9500. If you have a comment or question about HealthWise, call 704-371-8836 or email us at healthwise at wtvi.org or go to the website wtvi.org. If you are interested in being a guest on HealthWise or like to sponsor a HealthWise program, please call Suzanne Milkey at 704-372-2442. Learn more about HealthWise and other local productions at WTVI.org. Go to our website and you will see current and upcoming events on air and in the community. That and much more at WTVI.org.